Good afternoon and welcome here. I would like to introduce myself. I'm Fernando Hebert. I'm the pastor here at the Rosal Evangelical Church and I will be officiating this, this service here with you today. So I would like to uh, invite you as you stand, pray, bow your heads and pray and we are going to start with the service. Heavenly Father, we come before you here today and we want to have this celebration of life, celebration of Peter Thiessen that was a brother, that was an uncle, he was a cousin, he was a friend. He was respected by so many of us. We know that he wasn't perfect, just as none of us is. But Lord, we are here today to celebrate. But most importantly, we are here to celebrate the miracle that you've done in our life of salvation. And we want to celebrate that today. I ask you that you could be present in this service today, that your name could be glorified above everything else in this time that we spent together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As I said, I have the privilege of being the pastor here at this church. And I would like to, on behalf of the family, uh, Will, Jake, Dave, and Tina, welcome. And also the extended, fa extended family, I would like to thank everyone here for coming. Your support here today is very important, it's very special, and your ongoing prayers for these uh, family members that are left are very appreciated. Also to those who offered practical support uh, in some way to the family, it's very much appreciated. And on behalf of our church here, the Rosal EMC, and all of us here, I would like to, you, Will, Jake, uh, Dave and Tina, who are not present, and all the family, extended family, we want to express our deepest sympathies from all of us, all these people that share with you here today. And I'm pretty sure you had the opportunity to look a little bit around, and you see that there's many of your friends, people that you know, came to uh, spend this time with us here today. Today we are here to remember Peter, but we're also here for you to show your love and support and to grieve ourselves. We may not be able to fully grieve as maybe the family does, the close family, but we can stand with you in the midst of all this time. But we're also here to acknowledge, thank, and we can lean into the God whom Peter's life was committed to and he pointed to. I personally didn't have the opportunity to meet Peter personally as he was a shy and quiet individual, and you'll probably all agree at some point about that. But in different testimonies that I heard from many of you that I had a small connection, that I have a small conversation in regards to, to Peter, two things came up, and that was more than once. His daily practice of scripture reading. He always had his Bible with him, and together with his daily bread devotional material. Another person told me that he was a very humble person and he would always put others before himself. That to me is a very encouraging statement, knowing that he knew the truth, he knew his Bible, he read it, and the truth was with him until the last day of his life. It came as no surprise to God that Peter left us here. As it did maybe us, it came as a surprise. But it grieved God. In the Psalms it tells us that the precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants, one of his children. In a way we all knew this day would come. And to be honest, because we know that's true for all of us, we will all one day go through the same thing. But I don't think anyone quite expected it could be maybe today. This, with Peter, was not anyone's planning calendar except God's plan. And there is so much comfort in knowing that God knew. There is also so much comfort in the fact that Peter was spiritually ready for this day. Of course, that does not stop all your grief, it doesn't stop your loss. And of course, we gather in part to share that journey knowing that our human frailties are part of the way that God has designed his creation. 
It can be sometimes hard to understand, but God really knew what he was doing when he gave us frail human bodies that would not last because he has great future plans. God also knew of his plan to strengthen and comfort those of us here who remain behind those who mourn. So together we will find comfort in God's sovereignty, but also in his strength, his compassion, and the peace his present brings. We will celebrate his wisdom that directs us directs a plan bigger than we can understand. A plan that, that is directed by his love and compassion. Today, more than almost any, we need to find ourselves in the person and presence of God. Psalm 73, verses 23 to 26 says this, Yet I am always with you. You hold, by my hand. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? The earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God isn't the strength of my heart and my portion forever. This is our hope. And now it's Peter's reality. Psalm 61 verse 1 to 4 says this, Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong power against the foe. I longed to dwell in your tent. I longed to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. I would like to invite you to stand as we start again with a prayer. And after that, we will be singing some songs. So I invite you to stand with me as I would like to pray and as we ask for the presence of God to be rich and real for us one of us here today eternal God our Heavenly Father who loves us with an everlasting love and who has the power of life over death today of all days we acknowledge our weakness and need in the shadow of your greatness but we are comforted comforted to know that the God of all creation is not just aware of us here today, but you are present with us, making this a holy place, a holy time. And you're not unaware of any of us, and of any and all details about our needs and our hearts today. What a comfort, Lord, to be in your presence, the presence of the Creator of all, knowing that you are fully aware of each of us and the swirling sea of emotions we feel today. So God, today we are here looking for your presence to touch our lives and our hearts with the strength that comes from the truth of the resurrection and salvation. So today we are waiting upon you, asking you to strengthen us with the power. Fill the empty places in our hearts with your love, to comfort the hurting places with your peace, and to visit the lonely places with your presence. Tell us today that your wisdom is indeed all-knowing, that your care is all-powerful and your love is unending. We look for strength even as we celebrate and remember today this life that has ended on earth, but has not ended. It has really just begun. I ask you to bring your presence to bear in a special way today through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stay standing, if possible, as we are going to be singing two songs. Number 460 in your hymnal, if you have one available.
verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. Thank you for leading us in these two songs. Uh, one thing that when I had a conversation with uh, Jake and also with Will a little bit about, about the service, uh, they had mentioned that they didn't want to have anything too long or anything too big about the service or not made about Peter. But of course, we are here in a remembrance time, remembering what, who Peter was. So I'd like to, if you are interested, if you would like to, uh, maybe share a word or a testimony, something that you would like to share about an experience that you had with Peter. I would like to open this time now for, for a time of sharing, if anybody has something uh, in their mind. So please, there, you can gladly come up here on stage if you are not ashamed or if you're not afraid, but there's also a microphone here on the floor. You can just come close and uh, use that microphone. Anybody? Yes. Um, we, we spent 
many, many, many <coughs> days in the summer, in the winter, whatever. And we go out to the barn and milk cows with him. And he would teach us things as he went. And always very gentle, always very patient. I don't know if there's many people more patient than Uncle Pete was. He, he, um, he meant a lot to all of his nieces and nephews, and I hope they all get up here because I know that I'm not, I'm not an exception. Everybody felt the way that I feel about him. And, um, you know, he was going to put the kettle on when you walk in the door, and he's going to make you some kind of food if you were hungry. And, yeah, we spent, we spent lots of time for a child up there in the garden and all these things, and there's just been, it's, it's sad to see him go, but I didn't know that he's in heaven. There was no doubt in my mind. He was, well, often he would walk in and he would have his Bible open and there would be gospel music playing. And he, I, think, I think he read his Bible a lot. And when the Bible talks about out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, he never had a, a mean thing to say. He, he didn't have a mean bone in his body. Always very compassionate with animals, with people. He never wanted to see an animal suffer. He was a great example to a lot of people. Thank you. Anybody else would like to share a memory? Please. Oh. oh sorry. Lady So most of you know, I spent a lot of time at the house, the home place, with Grandma, Uncle Pete, Uncle Jake, my dad, and I spoke to him last few years. He calls me at least once every two weeks. I check in on me, make sure my kids are good, make sure I have my daily bread. I can still think back to Uncle Pete pumping water at the well, and it would just strike him to pray, and he would take his head off, he put it on top of the well, and he would stand there. We didn't talk, because we knew better. And his connection with God was so amazing that it made you strive for that. You wanted to have that relationship because he did, and you saw how important it was to him. He was very patient. We know me. He was very patient. <laughs> And I am so grateful that I had him in my life because I am the person I am because of him. And having him be the role model he was. When my dad went, I kept telling him, no, you're gonna take his place. I mean, he always did anyways, but he didn't have kids in the man that I feel like with his daughters. The way he loved me and cared about me, he didn't have to say it, I knew. It was hard when he did, though, because I knew that things weren't good when he was willing to admit that he loved you. He, you knew that things weren't, he wasn't doing well. I'm so glad that he's at peace and that he's with Grandma and Grandpa and my dad and Uncle Isaac. And I see them looking down at all of us. They're going to be with us forever, walking with us and giving us those guidance and wisdom that they did for so many years. I still love you, Uncle and Tina and Uncle David, we hope that they are with us and can continue uh, to be the strong family that we are. And I, again, I thank God every day that you put him in my life because I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be who I am. Thank you so much. Peter's cousin, and uh, we grew up together. I'm a little younger than he was, and I have a lot of good memories about Pete. Uh, you know, like like the two before me said, you know, how generous and how kind Peter was, and I think every story you hear about him is going to be the same thing. Um, like he was a shy man, but when he opened up, he was always about God. And we would joke around with the rest of the family, and as a lot of the Peters, I could joke a lot too, but 
he calmed us down and he talked about the Bible and about God and he knew who he believed. And uh, Peter was a good man. And I'm just glad that he is up there with my family, is his family, and a great mom. And uh, there was a lot of good things. When I was going through a tough time or if he was having struggles, he would always bring up the scripture. And we would talk and we would have great chats about things and he had a lot of wisdom that God gave him. And uh, I learned a lot from Peter. I really did. And uh, you know, those are good things when you can learn things from from other people and take it to heart. It's, a, it's something that you'll live life long with, you know. And that he did, and uh, I mean, you could go on and on and on about Peter. You could. And uh, he's just, he was just so kind that every time he'd drive out to the farm there, the home place, whether Dave and I would come from Alberta, he'd be, he'd be working out in the yard, milking cows or carrying water, and no matter how he felt, he never complained about work. He always did it. And like they said to you, he'd always, he'd always make you a meal, and you know, you would always have a great time there. You'd never regret going there. You'd always have those good times together. And, and he was a patient man. I remember once at my dad's place, just north of there, uh, we were out hunting around. I love hunting and fishing. And, and Peter liked all that kind of stuff too. But I remember there were some magpies up in a tree. And he, he was the first one to say, I'll climb up there. And he started climbing up there. And it was pretty neat to see this guy climb up there because I was sort of scared of heights and him doing this. And then there was another neighbor who had a 410 shotgun. I don't know if you know what that is, but he shot just above him, about five or six feet. And the mud was coming off the nest onto his head. And if it had been me, I would have jumped down and I would have been really mad at this guy. But Peter was so mild and so kind. <coughs> And yet he was annoyed, I could tell, but he held it together much better than I would have. And in the end, he did get the magpie, but anyhow, he was just a very patient man. And he was, he was just a great guy all around. And, you know, God, uh, in heaven, they were very blessed to have him up there. And uh, for Jake and Will and, and Dave and Tina and Mary Ann and for all of them too, uh, you know, in our thoughts and prayers. And, um, Pete was just a great guy, and I, I will miss him too. He was a great guy. God needs him to be great. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Jake. Yes, please.
Thank you. I mean, we'll have opportunity later to also share around the tables, but if there's anybody else that would like to share something, a memory or something, please, uh, this is the time. As I mentioned, I don't even had the chance to, to meet Peter, but just from hearing testimonies of who he was, I'm pretty sure that he was a, a respected, a loved man. And as I said before, he probably wasn't perfect. I've never met a person that has been perfect, and he was probably not the only one. But he knew one thing, he knew his Savior. He knew Jesus Christ. And that is so encouraging. And that's why he, I imagine that most of you are here today. Because you know that he had a Savior. And that he lived for him and he believed in him. You know, that is something that we all try to think very little about. But unless or if the Lord delays his coming, we will all go by this way of the grave. And that carries for most people the fear of what happens next because it's unknown we don't know what is going to happen there's only one source that gives the truth about life after death and that source is the bible it's the word of god which peter knew the scripture says in hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 just as people are destined to die once just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment you know, that is something that we all must face when our time comes. But death need, to be, need not to be a fearful thing to the one who is trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The scripture says that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried on the third day and he rose according to the scriptures. The Bible is very clear on that subject of death. And eternal life. In the fifth chapter of, the, of John's gospel, Jesus said this, You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that, you test, that, sorry, that testify about me. Yet, you refuse to come to me to have life. So there is eternal life only in Christ. Eternal life only in Christ. In Christ. The scripture teaches us that it is wonderful to do good works, of course. And that is also how the stories that we heard, it's about good works, about experiences that we had of Peter. But we know that everybody should be doing good works. But our good works, the Bible says, can never earn us a place in heaven. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and I 8 and 9, which you, I think, already heard once, at least, in your life, they say this, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourself. This is a gift of God. Salvation is not by works, so that no one can boast. Everyone has to answer for themselves before God. And it's not my place, it's not your place to judge. But we should prepare ourselves in this lifetime to meet God and not wait until it's too late. As we are coming to this so-called Holy Week, the week before Jesus walked uh, his last few days on earth, before he was crucified, before he was buried in, and he rose again, I was studying the passages regarding that time and in a moment, Jesus, as he was talking to his disciples regarding of what was to come, he said to them a beautiful passage that I'm going to use for this message here today. It's actually in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. And this is Jesus speaking to his, to his disciples. He says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas, who was one of the disciples, said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I think of all the passages of Scripture, all the words of encouragement that bring comfort in the, to the human heart. This has to be, in my opinion, one of the most beloved passages in the Bible. Because it, it says it's beloved not only because it gives us hope and not only the hope of Christ's return, not only the hope of everlasting life, but the hope of peace and comfort in the moment for those who are going through trials. Psalm 46 verse 1 says this, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. And I tend to think, I tend to think that Jesus had this, that song in mind, the Psalm 46 when he spoke these words, because what does he say? Let not your heart be troubled. But you notice Jesus doesn't deny the trouble, that trouble exists. He doesn't deny that life can be difficult. Instead, he gives reason why you and I, why we should take comfort. If you can, give me a moment, and I'd like to expand a little bit on the context of this passage. Jesus had been telling his disciples that he was going to leave them. He was preparing them. He was telling them he, I, that I'm going away. And several times he had told them that he was going to be betrayed, that he would be arrested, that he would be tried, and after that be put to death. And they just did not understand that. They did not believe it. And how could that be possible, they said. They said, Jesus, you're the Messiah. How was the Son of God, the Savior of Israel, the, indeed the Savior of man from every nation, tribe, and tongue, how could he be arrested and be put to death? Those were the questions that they asked. He was supposed to rule over a kingdom with no end. That's the hope they had. See, there are so many things the disciples did not understand. For at this point, they did not understand that Jesus had to die on the cross as an atonement for sin. They didn't understand about how he spoke of his departure into heaven and how he would send the Holy Spirit to be their comforter in their life and their guide. They didn't understand. And there are still many things that we don't understand. And it has been said that God works in mysterious ways. But what does Jesus do? He gives one simple instruction. And you know what it is? He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. So let me ask you, everyone here present, and you can just answer in your mind, in your own heart. Do you believe in God? And do you believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God? There may be some here who do not know or who do not believe that. I would simply ask you this. If you do not trust in God, where do you put your trust? Do you place your trust in yourself? Do you place your trust in others? If you do not trust in God, where do you place your trust? You know, if there is no God, if there is no life after death, then all we have is this, to eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But the good news of the gospel is that if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, the promise is for you. And what does Jesus say? In my Father's house, are many rooms, there are many mansions. And if 
I were not so, I would have told you. You know, Christians, we will often ask unbelievers the question, uh, this question, and maybe you've heard this, maybe you've said it to others, but it's an important question, and it is this. If you, would to, if you were to die today, where would you go? If you would die today, where would you go? If you were to die today, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven? I mean, can a person know that? And if so, how can a person know that? Well, there is a, something called the Romans Road. It's a, a book of the Bible, the book of Romans, and it has different passages, as it's called, a road. It's an important tool found in the Bible to help people like you and me to know if we are going to heaven. And it starts with this, Romans 3.23. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Romans 5, verse 8 says, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. And Romans 10 verse 9, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Another thing that really no one can disagree with is that Jesus is the most influential man in the history of the world. Even though if you don't believe in God and Jesus Christ, you will have to agree that he was very influential in the history. Even those who do not believe in him will still regard him as a good man, a wise and moral teacher maybe. Well, if a person really believes that he was a good man and a wise teacher, don't we have to take him at his word? And what did he say? He said, in my, father house, in my father's house are many mansions, for not so I would have told you. You see, we are not interested here in just telling people things just to make them feel better. This, we believe, is truth. We, will, we believe it by faith that this is the truth. And Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Something everyone needs to realize, the Bible isn't just some religious text for people in the church in general. And Jesus isn't speaking in general terms. He is speaking in very specific terms. And more importantly, he is, he is speaking in personal terms. He has gone to prepare a place for you. Yes, he is speaking to the disciples at this time in John's Gospel. But by extension, he is speaking to all of those who can have placed their trust in him. So funerals, they remind us of how short life really is and how important it is so to keep a right relationship with one another. Because once that person has slipped out into eternity, you can never ever tell them how much you love them or how much you appreciate all that they have done for you. So based on that, we should tell all those who we love how much they really mean to us while we have the opportunity. We know life is too short. It's far too short to ever hold forgiveness to those we ha that have done wrong, have done us wrong. All, us ha all of us have lost loved ones. And it's never easy. No matter how long they were with us, 
But thousands of years ago, a young shepherd who would eventually become the king of Israel wrote a psalm that blessed countless hearts throughout the ages. That man was David. And the song that he wrote was a psalm, and the psalm was the 23rd psalm. And this psalm of comfort, I would like to read it with you. And I invite you to, if you want, to read it along with me. The words are going to be on the wall. So we're going to all be reading from the same uh, translation. But as I do that, I would like to invite you, if you are able to, to stand with me. I would like to invite you to stand as we pray, uh, read the psalm. And I will pray after that. So please stand with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord God, the promise that you are preparing a house for us. What a beautiful promise we have, a promise that already Peter is experiencing to live in the house of the Lord forever. And Lord, as we look to that moment that we are also going to be in your presence, by the time that we are here still behind, left behind, Lord, that we might look up to you, that we might Believe in you so that we also could enjoy the promise that you've given us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to be singing one more song, and then I'll bring the closing prayer and the benediction after that. So please, Annie and Elaine. Mm -hmm. Number 554 in your hymn box.
Just bow with me for prayer. Father, we come with expectant hearts, with needy hearts, hearts looking for your presence to touch, to comfort, and to heal. Thank you for meeting us here with your presence and your truth. Especially we ask you, Father, that you would continue to pour your love, your mercy, your grace and peace in our hearts. As you continue this day, we ask you to direct our thoughts and hearts and minds, our conversations, that they would be pleasing to you and uplifting to one another. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and, not, and the love of God and His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you. Amen.